Hi, I'm Corey Nathan, and this is Talking Politics and Religion Without Killing Each Other. You're home for edifying, provocative, and fun conversations among high profile public figures and regular folks like me. We talk about faith and politics and all kinds of topics that really matter in our culture. So if you're tired of all the screamers out there taking all the oxygen out of the room and you want to join us and taking some of that space back, you'll love talking politics and religion without killing each other. Thanks for spending some time with us. Enjoy today's show. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are talking politics and religion without killing each other. I am your host, Corey Nathan, and so grateful to have a place to talk about faith and politics and big ideas in our culture with all kinds of interesting, accomplished folks of goodwill in good faith. It's really easy to find us and support us, and that's on politicsandreligion.us, politicsandreligion.us. Check it out. Becoming a patron will really help us continue to have the conversations like the one we're having today with Dr. Paul D. Miller. Professor Miller is a political theorist and political scientist focusing on international affairs, the American experiment, and America's role in the world. Previously, he spent a decade in public service as director for Afghanistan and Pakistan on the National Security Council staff under both President George W. Bush and President Barack Obama. He was also an intelligence analyst for the CIA and a military intelligence officer in the U.S. Army. He's currently a professor of the practice of international affairs at Georgetown University. He's also a research fellow with the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission and a visiting professor with the American Enterprise Institute's Initiative on Faith and Public Life. Dr. Miller writes widely on international affairs, public theory, religion and public life and film and culture. I don't have any questions, but I might have to um, build one in about the film and culture part. Uh, His most recent book is The Religion of American Greatness, What's Wrong with Christian Nationalism, which we'll be talking about a great deal today. He's also the author of Just War and Ordered Liberty, American Power and Liberal Order and Armed State Building. And he's also working on two more volumes to follow up The Religion of American Greatness. So I hope we'll get into that as well. Uh, More of his writing has appeared in the Washington Post, the New Republic, Mere Orthodoxy, the American Interest, the World Affair, I could go on and on. Uh, He's he's been published in quite a few publications. Uh, Dr. Miller holds a PhD in international relations and a BA in government from Georgetown and a master in public policy from Harvard University. Dr. Miller, having read all that, I'm tired. I don't know how (laughs) how are you able to keep all that up? (laughs) Hey, Corey, thanks for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to the conversation. You bet. You bet. You know, to start, I was curious about, not so coincidentally, since we're a show about politics and religion, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about your religious upbringing, as well as when you began to develop an interest in government and national affairs. I was raised uh, going to church, raised in a Christian household, going to either Baptist or non-denominational churches pretty much throughout my life. There was a, a year or two in grad school when I went to a church that was right on the borderline of being charismatic. Um, but uh, right now I'm a member of a Southern Baptist church, <clears throat> um, interested in politics as long as I can remember. Uh, my dad actually ran for Congress when I was uh, in high school, so I helped out with his campaign. Alas, we did not win, um, but I remember vividly, you know, lots of conversations about politics. This is mid-90s. Lots of conversations about politics in that time frame. And then, of course, 9-11, right? That was uh, a formative event for me. Uh, I was just getting out of my master's program at the time. I was in the Army, uh, but I had not started my PhD in international relations yet. So 9-11 really catalyzed a a career, you know, where I focused on international affairs and served in the government for a decade. Um, And now I'm teaching that stuff and writing about everything I want to. Uh, So that's a very short summary. Yeah. Uh, And did you grow up in the... D.C. area? No, I grew up in Oregon, actually. I was born on the West Coast, raised in Oregon. I came out uh, here for college. I was an undergraduate at Georgetown and uh, spent, I guess I'm coming close to about 20 years now in the D.C. area, unfortunately. (laughs) uh, I I still love to call myself an Oregonian, but I've now lived more of my life in this area. Okay. I'm curious, and we'll talk more about this uh, later in the conversation, but since you developed an early interest in government and politics, even having your dad run for office, as well as being brought up in the church, 
did you did you start to form political positions on given issues based on your theological convictions or is that too complicated of a way to to even think about it for for a kid i mean i guess i'd say i was born and and raised within uh the christian right um that is to say i was a Repu- I, I was a republican for, for partly because i was just a conservative right I believed in low taxes and that kind of stuff but also because I thought it was, you know, and I still believe that as a Christian, I have to support unborn life. I have to support religious liberty um, and things like that. And that seemed to be, be more consistent with the Republican Party. Now, these days, I'm politically independent. A lot of my views have not changed that much. I guess I'd still call myself politically right of center. I just think the Republican Party isn't actually conservative anymore. This is gets us into the book. Yeah. I think the Republican Party is more more accurately described as a as a nationalist party. Uh, and I and I'm not. I'm not a nationalist. And so I I've come to disagree with the the party that I was a member of for much of my life. Um, even though today I'm still again happy to call myself kind of right of center or or even conservative. Um, yeah. There you go. Now I know in your professional life you have been in academia for for a good portion of it. Uh, but I'm also now that you mentioned Oregon, I, I know that a lot of parts of Oregon are, are quite blue. Uh, so I was curious if you went to a public school and if so, were you in a very blue part of the state? Uh, did you find yourself as a, kind of a black sheep in, in, in that area or was there conformity in what you began to believe both religiously as well as politically? I guess I'd say. So uh, yeah, Oregon is fairly blue. I mean, it's it's deep blue except for the eastern part of the state, which I never visited until recently. Mm. And uh, I w- I grew up in a in a college town, and college towns do tend to be more more blue than blue. Um, I went to public schools K through twelve. Uh, never stepped foot in a private school until I went to college. And how do I put this? I guess I've just grown accustomed to living my entire life as a kind of a both religious and, and ideological minority in, in everywhere I've been. To me, that feels normal. It feels more abnormal to be in a bubble where everyone agrees with me. It's it's hard to find a, a group of more than ten people who agree with me, uh, <laughs> you know, and anywhere I've really lived. And that's that's okay. I kind of think it'd be helpful if more Americans were were used to that sort of feeling. Um, maybe a lot of our culture wars come from the kind of cognitive dissonance of entering into spaces where, oh my gosh, all of a sudden there's like lots of people who are different and who disagree with me. Um, you know what? That's okay. You know, it's a big country. Lots of people live wrong. Lots of people believe wrong and we can still get along. I hope. Yeah, I hope so. And that's what our project is all about. Frankly, I've that's right. found myself in that type of situation, both in my church communities, as well as vocationally. I spent a lot of my time in the entertainment industry. So uh, often I'm in these conversations with folks that maybe make some of my entertain friends from the entertainment industry, make assumptions about you know, my political views because I go to church, you know, or, or my church friends make assumptions about my political views or uh, what have you because of uh, being in the entertainment industry. But um, yeah, I, I, I find that it force it's, it's a healthy exercise because when I'm talking with people, whether it's on theological issues, political, social issues, and I find folks that really dis- that we disagree, I have to question a lot of my own assumptions and Sometimes I'll learn something new. I'll find that, oh, you know what? That's that that's not right. I, maybe it's I, I should think differently about a certain subject. Sometimes it just uh, gives me a more nuanced understanding of, of important issues. So that seems the way you're describing uh, your upbringing. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, having gone through undergrad, grad, you know, various levels of graduate school, um, how you're describing it is is. Yeah. So I vote yes. That would be healthy for our, our <laughs> public uh, discourse. So uh, I was curious before we get into the book, uh, having worked in both the Bush and Obama in administrations, this might sound like an ignorant question, but how unique is that to have folks who work in both Republican and Democratic administrations? So to, to be very precise, I was not a political appointee. Um, at the time, I was a civil servant. I, I worked for the CIA and they seconded me over to the White House uh, on the National Security Council staff, where I worked uh, as the director for Afghanistan and Pakistan. And we're talking 2007 and eight, and then into 2009, right through the presidential transition. So the fact that I was a civil servant is kind of what enabled that to happen. It is a little rare. Even many of the civil servants, they choose the end of a presidential term to rotate back to their home agencies. 
And of course, virtually all of the political appointees uh, depart. 2009 was a unique year. It was uh, the first presidential transition in wartime since 1968, I think. And for that reason, uh, President Obama uh, and his national security advisor, Jim jo General Jim Jones, they reached out and they specifically asked uh, a couple of teams to stay and provide continuity in wartime, which I was more than happy to do. And, and my colleagues working in Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan all stayed. Uh, and of course, he also kept on Secretary of Defense Robert Gates and uh, my boss, General Doug Lute, all worked through the transition. I think that was the, the right thing to do. I was happy to serve my country that way. Um, I came to disagree with some of the decisions that President Obama made. But, you know, again, uh, he was the elected president, had every right to make them. And I, I provided the continuity I could. And then it was time to go after a couple of months. Mm. Yeah. Uh, now, nah, I have so many more questions. But uh, but. <laughs> Uh, maybe that'll be for another conversation. I really want to get into the book. There's so much here to dive into. So, okay, early in the book, the, uh, and again, the religion of American greatness, what's wrong with Christian nationalism? So early in, uh, and by the way, for our listeners and folks that are uh, engaging with us, I can't commend this book highly enough uh, because it is a sober uh, we'll get into it, but it's a sober analysis, uh, a deep dive into what nationalism is more broadly, what Christian nationalism is, looks at it from a number of different sides. I think um, uh, Professor Miller gives gives it a fair shake. You know, it, we'll talk about this in a second, but um, before he gets into the argument against nationalism, he tries to articulate an argument for nationalism. It, could I could I actually? Yeah. You, you point out how I start the book or I, in chapter three, I kind of give the stage over to people who argue in favor of nationalism and Christian nationalism. You know, it, it occurs to me that, um, and I, I haven't quite said this before, but the style of argument in this book is itself part of my argument, right? It's my effort to treat the other side fairly, to characterize their arguments in the strongest terms possible, uh, to take them seriously and not to do hot takes, not to... right. And I guess what I'm saying is what I tried to do with the book was model what I think is a healthy way of arguing. Um, and I, maybe I didn't get it fully right. I hope I did. But I but I, I want that to be part of the message of the book itself. It's not just an argument against Christian nationalism. It's also a model, I hope, for how to argue well, how to disagree well, yeah. and how to even love the people you're disagreeing with while you're disagreeing. You know, it's a, it's a great point because I, at times... To be candid, I felt intellectually stretched in, in a similar way to when I first started reading N.T. Wright's, um, his bigger volumes, uh, starting with um, New Testament and the People of God. Uh, and then especially in Jesus, I don't know if you, you've read any of his work, but um, it's five volumes, uh, the second volume being Jesus and the Victory of God. And that, that volume in particular, there's at least 150 pages at the beginning of the volume where he engages with other academics directly on the same topic, basically history work, theological work on first century Israel or Palestine, what have you. So I, I that's a high recommendation, by the way, because NT Thank you. Is, um, is certainly one of my favorite historians and theologians of our day. But I, I was stretched. I, you know, I, I, I sensed a, a great deal of exactly what you're saying here, that you weren't Basically, like you said, it wasn't hot takes that you just stretched out into a book length. It was really a, a fair treatment, an academic treatment. And I, I learned a great deal. It, it, there's so many parts of the book that gave me a great deal to think about. So thank you. I appreciate that. So, OK, so this was what I was starting to ask earlier. Um, you, you talk about the distinction between cultural evangelicalism and biblical Christianity. So can you describe what you mean by that? The difference between cultural evangelical, yeah, I think I use the phrase tribal evangelicalism and, and biblical Christianity. One of the things I try to do in the book is talk about American evangelicalism less as a, a religious or theological category and more as a cultural and sociological reality. Uh, because it's, you know, it's, it's both. The, the word evangelical is part of the, the Reformation heritage, simply means somebody who wants to share the good news of Jesus Christ. In that case, I'm an evangelical. I think you're an evangelical. There's lots of us around. But of course, we also know that in the kind of late 20th century forward, the word has come to uh, accrete some political and cultural kind of connotations and, and even baggage. 
And that's what I wanted to look at. What is that baggage? What does it mean culturally to be an evangelical? Um, and in America, that label is correlated with all kinds of other things. It's correlated with being politically right wing. It's oftentimes, strangely, correlated with a belief in gun rights. Now, look, you can agree with gun rights. I'm not saying they're bad, but it's kind of weird to associate that with evangelicalism. I think they're very disconnected. Um, it tends to be correlated with a belief in immigration restrictions. Same thing. Maybe there's arguments there, but I don't think it's a natural flow from evangelicalism. And so this cultural thing of evangelicalism is kind of what I, I wanted to look at and isolate from Christianity, which is really a belief in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that applies to all people's tribes, tongues, and nations. And it's been true throughout all of history across cultures and times, right? So biblical Christianity is this huge thing and much deeper. And we inhabit a one particular cultural embodiment of it. You might call it second great awakening Christianity, right? It's this particular cultural expression of Christianity that came to fruition really in the Anglo-American world starting in the 1830s. And, and our, again, cultural embodiment of Christianity owes a lot to that, that fountainhead for better and for worse. There's a lot of good things that came from it, right? Second great awakening Christianity is full of crusading moral reforms like abolitionism, right? That's a good thing. Uh, but some of those moral crusades weren't all that great. You know, the British Empire was also part of that <laughs> crusading spirit. And prohibitionism, actually pro-slavery arguments were also part of that. Uh, and so we need to be able to examine our own cultural heritage and recognize the ways that we got it wrong and recognize the ways that it, it departs from biblical Christianity, even if it wears the label of evangelical. That's interesting. So you say there are roots tracing back to at least the 1830s. And I, forgive me if I get some of the wording wrong, because I didn't write this in my notes, but I do remember later in the book, you do, uh, uh, you, you do a deeper dive into Jacksonian. It's a, it, there's a cultural heritage. Um, oh, Anglo-Protestantism? Anglo-Protestantism, but it, you're, you're tying it back to the 1830s. That's why I'm connecting yeah, yeah. it with uh, the Jacksonian yeah, and the Jacksonians, era. that's right. And, and some of the um, some of the values, some of the core values, you know, working the land, being good with tools, if I remember yeah. correctly. So what am I remembering? Help me fill in the blanks. So I'm drawing there from an author named Walter Russell Mead, who's just one of our best public intellectuals. Fantastic. I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, he, he's a giant intellect. And he wrote this book called Special Providence 20 years ago. And he talked about four different traditions or streams of thinking about America's role in the world, right? Wilsonians, Hamiltonians, so forth. And he said that Jacksonianism is the is America's folk culture, folk, F-O-L-K, folk culture. It's the culture of uh, the, the common man, so to speak, um, that really starts to grow from the frontier experience in the 19th century. Uh, and there you have a lot of English and Scottish settlers in the frontier, what would become the Great Plains and the South um, and the upper Midwest. Uh, and they're farmers, they're warriors, they're familiar with weapons, they take pride in that. They, they tell themselves stories about being ruggedly individualistic. Not always true, but that's the story they tell themselves. Politically, they're very right wing and attached to America. Uh, to call them patriotic is not entirely ice. They, they're very nationalist, right? Um, in the sense that they tend to identify with the nation so much that they think the nation is them. And it does tend to draw boundaries around the national identity that doesn't make a whole lot of room for people outside of their particular tribe. Uh, in other words, it tends to be exclusivist. Um, in its origin, back in the mid-19th century, it wasn't just racist, it was also uh, bigoted against other white people, right? This was this was British Protestants who didn't like the Irish, who didn't like the Germans, who didn't like the Italians, who didn't like Jewish people. Um, and also they were racist against you know, African-Americans and so forth. Now, Walter Mead's point is that uh, the Jacksonians have been, as tribalism goes, very liberal and uh, capable of growth. And so that sectarianism has dramatically softened over the decades, over the century and a half or so. And so it is a much more malleable group than it used to be. Um, there's still, I think, seeds or tendencies of some exclusivism in it. Uh, I think that the principle of exclusion is more culture than race. So I don't think it's accurate to say all Jacksonians are racist. And I do think there's a that, that culturalist 
or cultural exclusivist kind of strain within Jacksonianism, which is what we see showing up, I think, in the in the the, the MAGA movement and the Trump's movement. Right, um, it is a nationalist movement that wants to define the nation largely by reference to its majority demographic, uh, and you need to abide by that cultural heritage because we're the real Americans. Is kind of what they say sometimes. <laughs> Welcome to Democracy Ish. I'm Danielle Moody. I'm Wajahat Ali. And my God, is 2022 starting off with a banger? And Democracy Ish is going to be here to be your official guide out of the gaslight and the crazy. We will try our best to navigate this hellscape as our freedoms and democracy are under active assault. We will take you through the gauntlet with humor and hope and frustration and pain and allow you not to be gaslit. That is your new Democracy Ish. Okay, so uh, as you had mentioned in the third and fourth chapters of the book, you go a long way to describe what nationalism first by making the case for nationalism and then the case against it. There is one nugget I and you talked about this on a recent interview with David French uh, that I, I especially appreciated. I'm, I love jazz. So <laughs> and it kind of sums it up for me. Uh, Rich Lowry was making yeah. a case for nationalism by using jazz as an example that you countered. So I'd love for you to, uh, for lack of a better word, riff on that a bit, but yeah. also paint in the larger picture for, for us, the case for and the case against nationalism. Right. So you just invited me to summarize the whole book. <laughs> right. um, 30 seconds or less. No, no. Take take your time. <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best. And yeah, the jazz anecdote, I think, is one of the better ways of getting at it in, in a, in a Concrete anecdote. So I'll do the big wind up and then the pitch here. So the big wind up here, you know, what is nationalism? What is Christian nationalism? Uh, if you think America is a Christian nation, well, there's lots of ways to take that. And some of it are, are accurate. Like historically, Christianity is highly influential in American identity, all that. Okay. But if you think America is a Christian nation and you think we need to keep it that way, and it's partly the government's business to keep it that way that our government has a responsibility to pass public policies to privilege Christian identity, Christian social power, Christian norms and values. That's Christian nationalism right there. It's not a phrase for any and all Christian involvement in politics. I'm a Christian. I'm involved in politics. That's not Christian nationalism. It's not a name, I don't think, for the pro-life movement. It's not a name for advocacy for religious freedom. It, it's a name for all those policies designed to reinforce Christian power, social power, political power. Um, that's Christian nationalism. Now, the argument in favor of it is basically that's who we were. That's who we need to stay being. We need to keep on being that. Otherwise, we lose our identity. And also, sometimes they add, that's how we stay a democracy, right? They, they believe that our Christian heritage is the essential precondition for remaining a democracy. And so we, if you want to remain true to our, our democratic roots, we have to remain to our Christian heritage as well. And that's like the argument in favor of Christian nationalism. You can have a theological argument. Maybe they think it's the way of gaining God's blessing or what have you. All kinds of arguments against it, right? I think it's impractical. I think it's kind of dangerous. I think that it's you can't really do it uh, because it's very hard to draw boundaries around cultures. Uh, our culture changes. It just changes quite naturally over time, over decades and centuries. You can't stop it. Government's a really bad tool for trying to regulate culture. Um, and so using the government to engineer culture is a bad idea. We conservatives used to say that all the time with regard to the left. We used to say, my goodness, the left, they're trying to you know do social engineering. But now we're kind of doing a right wing version of the same thing. And I just I, I'm still conservative. I still think it's a bad idea, even if it's a, a different cultural template, one you know for, for Anglo Protestants. Okay, so how does jazz fit into this? Um, so Rich Lowry, the editor of National Review, wrote a book called The Case for Nationalism. Uh, and so he's unabashedly embracing the label and saying, yeah, let's be nationalists. And he's got this whole thing in there about our, our English forerunners, right? We were a British nation at first. We need to stay true to British values. Uh, and he's got a whole thing in there about the Bible and how we were founded by Christian, uh, uh, Christian people. All right, so he's very much in this vein of saying, Anglo-Protestantism, it's our heritage, and therefore it's our destiny. He's very he's at pains to say that that culture is not uh, racist and it's not intrinsically white. Uh, and I think I kind of agree with him that, you, you know, of course, you don't have to be white to agree to those values. But he even says, like, look, there are things in American culture that didn't come from white people. 
And his example is jazz, right? We all know that white people didn't invent jazz. And I'm pretty confident given a thousand years, we never would have like, that's just not, you know, that's not European music. Uh, and, and Lowry wants to celebrate jazz and say, look at this. It's proof that our culture that I think we need to preserve is not intrinsically white. Okay. So that's his argument. But he also says the hardcore of nationalism is to preserve the cultural nation. He thinks that nationalist governments should freeze frame our culture. It should say this here over here, this thing is American culture, and we're going to stay that way. So tell me how that makes sense with jazz. If you're an American nationalist living in 1900, you're going to look at the first beginnings of jazz, and you're going to say, which by the way, they did say at the time, that this is un-American. This, and they had really ugly racist things to say. They said it was jungle music. They said yeah. it was voodoo music. Uh, very nasty, ugly, racist things. And that's what American nationalists in 1900 and 1920, 1930 said about jazz, because they believed it was their responsibility to keep American culture traditionally American as they understood it at the time. So if you're going to embrace nationalism, you're going to reject jazz. If you're going to embrace jazz, you have to reject nationalism and the cultural essentialism that it that it comes with. You pick one. Which world do you want to live in? A world of only European and classical music forever, or a world where we allow cultural fluidity, cultural change, cultural innovation, and thus the world that includes jazz. Uh, I, I just, I'd rather live in a world with jazz, and that leads me to reject nationalism. So <laughs> I'm going to jump ahead a little bit, but uh, some of my questions might seem like I am determined to get you into trouble with your Sunday school class. <laughs> so, um, I'd like to share something you said at one point in the book. It was that you would not want to live in a country where drag queens were barred by law from going to the library or hosting an event. But this is actually a pretty serious point. So, um, you know, could you could you expound on that a bit and hopefully not get yourself into trouble with your uh, with your pastor? Yeah. <laughs> so so for listeners, this goes back to a debate starting, I think, in 2019. Uh over this thing called Drag Queen Story Hour, where, where there are there are people who dress up in drag go to public library spaces and read storybooks to children. Okay. Um, I've never been to one. I don't plan on going to one. And I would never <laughs> take my children to one. Just to be very clear about it, I don't condone or endorse Drag Queen Story Hour. I don't think it's a good thing. The debate isn't on whether it's a good or bad thing. The debate is, do they have the right as taxpaying citizens to use library event space? Um, and I think the answer must be yes, Otherwise, we're just being we're just bigots. We're just saying we're going to prohibit equal access to public resources on the basis of people's identity or beliefs or values. Right. And I you know, there's actually a constitutional principle here called viewpoint neutrality that says the government's not allowed to do that. Government can't pick sides and say, well, you over here, I like you. So I'm going to give you extra perks and resources and let you go to the library. You over here, I don't like you and I don't like your viewpoint or your identity or how you dress. Therefore, you don't get to rent library space, right? Constitutionally, government's not, not actually allowed to do that. Now, there's a bunch of nationalists and, and post-liberals who want to change that. They want to change viewpoint neutrality and explicitly tilt the playing field towards their side. And my, my question to them is, okay, you succeed for one election cycle. Guess what that will incentivize the other side to do? They will run for office, you know, mayor or library administrator. They'll win and they'll turn that right around on you and throw you out of the library. This is the whole pact of democracy. You know, freedom for me, freedom for thee. I think it's the political implications of the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If we're going to take that reciprocal altruism, translate it into political ideals, it is maximum liberty for me and for you. So if I get to use the library, you get to use the library. Footnote, I do affirm you can regulate conduct in public spaces on the grounds of public decency. But that applies to everyone equally after you get into the library. I do not think it is valid to preemptively say you're not allowed to use the library event space because of your values or your beliefs. Mm. Uh, that I think is just pure bigotry, which is why I say I wouldn't want to live in a country where that enshrines that kind of bigotry in law because that's an unjust regime. And I think that we Christians should be advocating for justice, even when justice means liberty for people I disagree with. So, okay. So now you bring up an interesting point. I don't want to um, dive a little deeper into this. At one point you say Christian nationalists have an impoverished view of the doctrine of God's common grace and overemphasis on the uniqueness of Christianity's moral code. And sometimes a chauvinistic attitude that Christians are the best at everything just because we believe the Bible. 
I would make it in my experience. I would say that you're you're specifying Christian nationalists, but I would say that this is a pretty predominant. I've come across this not just in Christian nationalists that this is a default posture, if you will, uh, on the part of a lot of folks I go to church with. Um, so, and this goes back to my earlier question. I wonder how this is being received by you know folks you're going to church with. Well, what, so I'd like you to. I'd, I'd like you to unpack that uh, a chauvinistic attitude. Christians are, are the best at everything just because we believe the Bible. So I'd like you to unpack that. But I'd also like to, to answer the question, how have you been received, whether it's folks that you're in a Bible study with or uh, going to church with? or I'm curious about both of those things. Yeah, so Christian nationalism sometimes shows up less as an ideology. I've kind of described the top-down scholarly ideology. It oftentimes shows up more as a just an attitude or or um, bottom-up kind of cultural practices. And that attitude that you observed is this idea that, you know, Christians deserve pride of place in the public square. You know, we invented America, uh, and so you all should be grateful that we're sharing it. Um, or we're the best at everything because we have the one true reliable source of knowledge in the Bible, which, by the way, we do, right? Um, how do I put this? I think that in many Christian circles, there's come to be uh, not just prudent caution on other sources of knowledge and wisdom, but a hostility, a skepticism verging on almost a, a nihilism of the possibility of knowledge outside of the Bible, which I think goes way too far. The result of that is this supreme confidence that we know stuff and everyone else doesn't really know anything. And I think that that is uh, a very stark dichotomy that is harmful uh, to the church. It is harmful to society. It is harmful to America. Our Christian forefathers, right, the, the early church fathers, talked quite, and up through the Middle Ages, talked about the virtuous pagans, Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, Cicero, uh, men who did not know Christ and did not read the Bible, and yet um, were actually quite wise, I think. I think that's a true statement. I think they were quite wise. They had insightful things to say about the world based on human reason. Now, I affirm human reason has fallen. It is a lesser authority, but it's still true. They can still reach, they can still say true things, um, even if they are not fully true or completely true or wholly reliable. In the same way today, all kinds of fields of knowledge uh, in, the, in, the, in the secular space can say true things the field of mathematics and the field of science, even the field of social science. I am a social scientist. So I tend to think that we can learn from other fields of knowledge, which means we can come together with non-Christians or with Christians who are in secular fields of study and talk about politics, find common ground, learn from one another. And it, and it means that Christians are not the automatic authority on every single issue. Um, if you want to know about immigration policy, don't just pick the random Christian. Go find somebody who studied immigration policy. And if they're a Christian, maybe they you can you can say, well, we probably share more foundational values. And if they're not, maybe you can still learn about the problem and then kind of formulate your own convictions. Does that make sense? It does. Uh, am, I, am I answering your question? You are. So a lot of this part of the book helped me understand what I was experiencing, and it gave it a, a language uh, to help clarify something that for the better part of 20, I guess, 22 years now, just wasn't making sense. You know, to put it in a very overly simplistic way, my kids went to a Christian school. And when we first were looking at it, the, uh, the case to go to Trinity was, hey, we have this special knowledge and it is um, and the proof that we're right is that our kids are the best looking, they get the best grades, they're always a captain on the sports team and, you know, go on down the list. Um, so it, there's something when you use the word, for example, chauvinistic, um, that made sense to me. So my question now is more of um, I'm asking you for advice, really. In the past, being the Jew from Jersey that I am, I haven't always encountered it in the most productive way. How have you found a productive way to uh, name this? Um, as well as to have productive conversations with, um, you know, with brothers and sisters in Christ. Mm. In my own life, I'd say I'm still working on it. Uh, 
you know, because professionally I, I spend so much of my professional life outside of Christian circles, I actually don't have to encounter this question, right? It's a question that occurs when you're inside Christian circles more often. And, and so I, I have to do some code switching here at, when I'm in other spaces. It's a tricky thing because I, I want to always affirm biblical inerrancy. And it is, it is a, you can never remind your fellow Christian in the pew enough to lean on the word of God and to trust what he has said in his word. And I don't want to lessen that at all. Also, when people have questions about burning social, cultural, political issues that aren't often spoken of directly in the Bible, then you have to say, let's go learn about this by, by looking at authorities, by looking at scholars, by looking at history and how this problem came about and what people say about it. Um, and that will never be of the same authority as the Bible, but it is, the, you know, we, we're told to love God with our minds, to take captive every thought, to seek wisdom. The entire book of Proverbs is there exhorting us to seek wisdom and understanding. Um, it all, and Ecclesiastes also says, of the making of many books, there is no end, <laughs> and much study wearies the body. So I want to I want to affirm and maybe exhort my fellow Christians to heed those messages in the Bible, to seek wisdom, to seek understanding, uh, to love God with your minds. And that means to practice thinking well, to study, to search for truth. Uh, and that is a good prefatory remark to then going off and doing all the work and consulting anybody you can. Right, right. That's actually a good, that's a good word because I, I found that the most productive conversations, because I've failed way more often than, uh, than not, but the some of the most productive conversations go somewhere along the lines of that's an interesting point. Let's keep reading, <laughs> you know, yeah. whether it's let's yeah. keep reading more of the chapter as opposed to just that half of the verse that you, that we picked out, or let's keep reading from good scholars on the subject. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. And, and uh, that I do hold that close being, you know, uh, uh, being the, the Jewish Christian that I am love the Lord, your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, mind, we, we, yeah. we needn't forget about that. So, okay. There was also another part, going back to drag queens, <laughs> there was, there's actually a larger part of the conversation. Um, and I really appreciated, again, referring to that, that dialogue you had with David French on, on the podcast, Good Faith, another recommendation, by the way. And it's about the difference and the tension between power and liberty. So could you help us understand the differences and then, you know, just, just unpack those, uh, that tension for us a little bit more. So in the book, I, I ask rhetorically, what should we Christians really be out for in our political engagement? Should we be out for political principle or political victory for Christian power or Christian principles? Uh, and I a variety of contrasts like that. In my conversation with David, he kind of picked up on that and he said, you know, this is really interesting, this contrast between sort of power and liberty. And his point was that liberty is the enemy of uh, power. If, if, if I have liberty, I'm able to use that liberty against people who are in power. And kind of definitionally, people in power almost always oppose or feel threatened by uh, the expansion of liberties. And that's that's true, by the way, around the world. Uh, who are the people who most oppose the growth of democracy? It's rich men of the ruling tribe, right? They're always the one who are in charge and so any expansion of the people's liberties comes at their expense. So they always oppose it. And, it, you know, the story in, in American history, the last 60 years, is the ruling tribe losing its power, right? White Christians have lost a tremendous amount of power in America over the last 60 years. That's just, it's statistically true. It's demographically true. It's also politically true. You look at voting trends and the growth of the electorate. And, and many Christians feel threatened by that. They feel that loss of power and believe that it is, defin by definition, wrong to, for our tribe to lose power. And what I'm saying is, it's not necessarily an evil thing, because the loss of our power has meant the growth of true liberty, true equality among our fellow citizens, whom we should love politically, even if that means some loss of our own power. By the way, I don't think the loss of our power has meant the loss of our rights. Um, Part of the loss of our power has been the, the gain in true religious freedom. Please understand, to your listeners, 
there was no true religious freedom for Roman Catholics clear up into the 1950s, 1960s. And the loss of Protestant power has been the gain of true principled religious liberty for all that we now benefit from. Our religious liberty is more well enshrined in constitutional law today than essentially ever before in American history, thanks to the gains uh, made since the really in the 1980s, 1990s. Uh, there was a some regrettable decisions in the 70s and 80s, little side note there. But in the last couple of decades, constitutional law and religious freedom has been fantastic. Our ability to have religious schools, to have our churches, to protect our tax deductions, to hire our own employees, to maintain our statements of faith, to hire and fire on the basis of those things, is more well protected now than ever before, um, even as we have lost social power. And I think that that's what we should really recognize is the goal of our Christian engagement is protect those principles, even if our social and political power has declined. So the notion that we have more religious liberty than arguably at any point in the history of our country, uh, if you turn on, uh, you know, AM radio, uh, Fox News for all of about five minutes, I think that there would be a, a lot of pushback against that. Can you uh, can you provide maybe some examples to support that that notion that, that we have more religious liberty now? Well, I'll say I understand where the pushback is coming from because there are cultural uh, currents, I think, that are pretty hostile to Christianity, right? I think that's a, that's also a true statement that in some parts of our country, and, and I'd say universities and you know the media, um, Christianity is not well regarded and not culturally welcomed. That's not necessarily, that's not a violation of our rights. We don't have a right to be celebrated wherever we go, but because there are some parts of American society that are a bit more hostile to our faith, it feels as if we are under assault. I will also say there's some, for example, some on the left have argued that Christian schools are abusing the First Amendment to discriminate against uh, gay people. That's the language they use. They would like to reinterpret the First Amendment to, to essentially shut down religious schools. Uh, now, they're never going to do that. They're never going to win. The Constitution is not with them. But when I hear that rhetoric, I too feel, you know, my religious liberty is being criticized there. Okay. So that's all my way of saying I sympathize with the concerns on the right that there could be directions in the culture that are hostile to religious freedom. Okay. Does that make sense, Corey? Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. So that's all my, that's my way of saying. This. Yeah. Now, uh, legally, constitutionally, again, we're on a winning streak um, yeah. at, at the court. We've won just a couple of weeks ago. There was that thing about the, the football coach praying on the 50 yard line. I don't know the details of that one. Well, I'm not sure that's the best case really to stake our religious freedom on, but look, he, he won. He can pray on the 50 yard line now. A couple of years before, there was actually a really significant ruling. I think it was called Espinoza that essentially struck down a state constitutional amendment that prohibited public funding for religious schools or something like that. If I understand that ruling right, it could usher in a whole new era in religious schooling in America going forward. So get David French on the, on the phone because he's a constitutional lawyer uh, who did these, these cases. And he could tell you, run down the list for the last 15 years, the last 20 cases, how our uh, religious liberty has been has been winning, and that's a that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and just as a side note, everybody who listens to this program knows I'm a huge fan of advisory opinions uh, with right. David French and Sarah Isger. Uh, Sarah has actually been on this program, and uh, it, it's interesting because that case, one of the cases that you cited, the coach and praying at the 50 yard line, it sounded like both Sarah and David were a little bit more ambivalent about that one than say the one um, main. Uh, there was a. a, a a case about a school in Maine, and uh, yeah. there are rural schools, so kids who don't necessarily have ready access to public schools. Um, I, I might be getting some of the specifics wrong here, but basically it's, well, can we get vouchers to school our kids privately? And exactly. does that include religious education if we so yeah. choose? So, you know, they the um, in that case, the ability to use those vouchers for religious education uh, one, I think that yeah. was appropriate because otherwise it would have been discriminating against uh, religion and coming out on the wrong side of the First Amendment, having both free exercise as well as the Establishment Clause both and keeping them both in view. So you brought up an interesting um, 
in your last comment, you brought up something interesting that I wanted to pursue. Uh, at what point in the book you say the left sometimes abuses and distorts the law to discriminate against Christians? And there are other places in the book where you refer to the left. And candidly, I, I stumbled. It, it was a stumbling block for me. Your characterization, and this is this is important because uh, for our folks to understand, Professor Miller is pursuing a multi-volume project. I think the next one, if I remember correctly, is doing a similar inquiry on the left as you've now done for Christian nationalism. So that's right. I would say that um, there are, to be fair, there are obviously examples of individuals who are making these very loud cases about stuff like this, just like you were just mentioning. But the fact is also that there are just as there's just as much wariness or weariness uh, from within groups one would consider the left of this sort of extremism. Uh, so <laughs> I guess at certain points in the book, when there was a reference to the left, it seemed like too broad of a generalization and thus a mischaracterization. Do, is, that, is that fair? Do, does that make sense, what, what I'm pushing back against? I hear you, and uh, you're not the first person to say something like that. Um, you're, you're right that my asides about the left were very brief and I think unsatisfying for those on the left. It, you know, in the first chapter, I kind of say so. <laughs> I actually kind of put down a marker. I say, look, this is not a book about the left. And it's really uh, written by, for, and to the conversation within the right about nationalism. And I, I wanted at the time to write one single book that was kind of everything, the left, the right, the center, everything. And it was just too big. So I know that uh, the couple of asides to the left, yeah, are are, are generalizations, right? Uh, and here my plan is to write another book. Uh, the, the working title is The Religion of American Progress, What's Wrong with the Progressive Left? Um, my hope in that book, right? You, you started by talking about how we the, the style of the arguments and all that is to do something similar. Right. We don't need another culture war takedown of the left. That's a dime a dozen. Fox News can do that. And anybody on Parler or Gab or whatever it is. And I don't want to do that. And the world doesn't need another one of those. I think what the world does need is a critique of the left that is loving and, a, and, a, and, a, and accurate and takes them at face value in their own words, but also says, have you really truly considered the full meaning of your words and where they come from? What is their history? And what have been the damaging implications of those words in the past? And do you see how there is some damage done today with the same ideas? That I think is gonna be my goal with the next book, because as I said, despite my sort of alienation from today's Republican party, I remain politically kind of right of center. Uh, I don't like claiming moderation or independence. I don't think that's actually the answer. Um, I think I wanna work for justice wherever on the spectrum that lies. And I think that there's a lot of problems on the left that uh, they they use the language of justice and equality. They act like it's an uncontested concept. And oftentimes it feels as if, it feels, as somebody who's on the other side here, that to disagree with anything the left says is ipso facto to be a racist or a homophobe or, or some form of a bigot. Um, and that's very, very frustrating. I think that we need to have a good faith dialogue where you're allowed to disagree and point out how the other side maybe gets it wrong without being uh, sort of defined out of bounds as an extremist. Yeah. Yeah. Believe me, I've come up against, uh, I don't know, for lack of a better description, sort of this collective narcissism uh, from mm -hmm. folks who are more progressive than I am. Yeah. But I, I take it as, at the same time, I, I, I take it as individual instances uh, that perhaps are prevailing, but I'm also just as allergic to, you know, listen, I, I do listen to the Will Cow majority or Hannity. Um, sometimes I'll turn on Tucker and the first 15 minutes of every program is a monologue about what the left wants you to do. And the left is trying to do this. And so I, I have an allergy to uh, sort of outsourcing uh, our thinking or allowing Tucker or rush before him to uh, be our, our sociologists in chief. Um, and, and specifically, it's kind of what I was asking about before. It's the generalizations, overgeneralizations that become mischaracterizations that allow for the vilifications. Uh, and that's, I think, what, uh, but it sounds like your project, you know, it's going to, I'm looking forward to it. I can't wait for 2026. <laughs> so, um, okay. So the chapter about nationalism and the Bible, 
uh, really got me thinking. As, as Christians, what I've often seen is a tendency to deploy, and we've talked a little bit about this, bits and fragments of scripture to justify our a priori impulses or preferences and causes. Um, but the way that you're utilizing scripture is as the starting point from which we derive our understanding and positions. So just as an example, uh, some might look at passages like when you deal with uh, 1 Samuel 8, when the Israelites were calling for a king as other nations had kings that, I quote, that we also may be like other all other nations, it says. Um, and many have gone through that portion of scripture in Samuel King's Chronicles to justify and give like this holy um, credence uh, to certain political systems. But I see when I read it, I, I, it's almost like I place myself in that story. And it's, it's, to me, it's more of a, a cautionary tale. Like in what ways are we making these uh, same mistakes? So um, perhaps you, you'd like to pick up on that particular point, but there, there are a few related questions that I'm curious about. In general, how does, you've talked a little bit about this, but I, I'd like you to address it a little bit more fully. How does scripture inform your political positions? Well, there's kind of two two questions or two conversations in there. One is simply about like if I'm starting from scripture and the ground up, how do I think about politics? But then there's also how do you engage with the ideas of nationalists and the way they use the Bible, and are they using the Bible correctly or incorrectly? Um, and so there's are related conversations, but they're a bit different. I think I'll focus on the second one. Okay. Uh, the the first one is a is is the next next book? <laughs> it's the third <laughs> book from now, uh, and maybe we can we, we'll, maybe we can circle back and get there here at the end of our time. Nationalists look to the Bible, right? Uh, and it's not not just a modern American Christian nationalists. This is true for centuries. Uh, they have often looked to the story of Israel as a kind of a model or template of national formation. They've said, "Hey, look, God laid out." A, an example for us. This is what it means to be a nation. And so we too should emulate Israel and be like them in some respect. And many nationalists have, have understood or believed their nations to have some kind of mission, some kind of destiny, even some kind of chosenness. Uh, and, and the more outlandish ones have, have claimed that we have a covenant with God uh, to accomplish his missions on earth. I hope I don't I need to spend time refuting that theologically. There's no evidence in the Bible for that. But I even want to take issue with this idea that Israel is our model for our secular polities. I don't think the Bible says that. Israel is many things. It's a, it's a very complicated thing to understand how to, how to understand what is Israel's relevance to our lives today as Christians. Uh, I look to Romans chapter, I think it's chapter 8, right? The children of Abraham according to the promise of the true, uh, true descendants of Abraham. So I think it means that as Christians, we look to the Old Testament, we see a model for the church, right? Uh, that is the polity that is in covenant with God. Israel in the Old Testament, the church in the New Testament. I think that's essentially the way we should read our Bibles. When secular nationalists or Christian nationalists use the Bible this way and say, no, no, we need to be more literally like Israel, I think they're missing the point of the Bible's storyline, right? Jesus didn't come in order to teach us how to build good secular polities. He came to inaugurate his kingdom, which, by the way, isn't America. I, I, I love America. I'm a patriot, but it's very important for Christians to keep uh, the kingdom of God separate from whatever polity they happen to live in. And history is replete with dangerous mistakes when Christians have looked to their particular polity, whether it's America or elsewhere, and said, oh, this is the first foundation stone of the kingdom of God. It can lead very easily to a, a sense of national self-righteousness national destiny, even kind of a messianic destiny, where you can start to justify all kinds of ugly things in the name of achieving your national destiny. Look, white Americans used this language to justify Indian removal in the 19th century. They talked about manifest destiny as a providential, God-given mission, and that mission allowed them to do things to Native Americans that we now recognize were quite bad. Mm. Let's let's be Let's steer well clear away from this language of national chosenness, of national mission, of being in a covenant with God. That is not true of any of our secular polities in that sense. Our churches are in a covenant with God, and we are indeed on a, on a hill 
uh, in sight of all people, being held accountable for our actions to be a display of God's glory. Our secular polities have a more humble mission. Uh, their, their ordination in Romans 14 is very simple. It's just to uphold justice and order as best possible in a fallen world and nothing more than that. There's so much more to get into, but I, I fear that uh, I, I'd end up keeping you here for about 10 hours. <laughs> um, if we, we haven't even gotten into the, the section on uh, uh, Donald Trump. Can you believe that? <laughs> but, <laughs> well, and that's, you know, I did not want to write a book about Donald Trump and I didn't. He's in one chapter. And, yeah. and, I, and, I, and that was by a choice. Oceans of ink has been spilled on the guy and American nationalism predated Trump by centuries and it's going to outlast him by centuries. Yeah. So I didn't want to focus the book on him, but it is appropriate to talk about him because he's a big part of the story. I, so one of the questions I did want to ask is after you dealt with that, um, you shed some light on why folks would be drawn to Christian nationalism. Like what, what is the, what is the attraction? What is the need there that's being fulfilled? So in any time when there's a lot of change, it's a pretty natural human tendency to be a little uncomfortable, even fearful, to not want change. Like we just generally tend to resist it, I think by temperament. And, and maybe a, in a given population, maybe a third, maybe a half of people are especially prone to, to not want to welcome change. When that happens, people cling to old certainties and they reassert old certainties and they maybe defensively, maybe, maybe even sort of belligerently uh, reassert and say, no, no, I reject this change, this old thing, this is what we were, this is what we are, this is what we will be. I think that's pretty universal. It's not unique to Americans, not unique to Christians. I think it's just human beings do this. And look at the amount of change in American life over the past half century and more that technological changes alone have caused revolutions throughout human civilization across the earth. Um, then you add on to that demographic changes in American society. White Christians are a smaller proportion of the population than essentially ever before since uh, European settlement first started uh, in the new world. Uh, so you have technological change, you have massive demographic change. And then in just the last decade and a half, you actually have some very significant economic change you have the 2008 financial crisis, and you have a kind of a delayed impact of the uh, the digitalization of the economy. A lot of blue collar workers getting thrown out of work because of robots and free trade, globalization, right? And so when you add all of this change together, economic change, social change, demographic change, technological change, the way things used to be ain't the way things are anymore. And it makes people uncomfortable, anxious, even fearful. And so, uh, one natural human reaction, reach back, grab something certain and old and say, no, no, I'm going to cling to this. And in the American context, the old traditional thing is cloaked in Christian language. It is saturated in Christian language. Everything in American society from the time of the founding, before the founding, all the way up until yesterday is saturated in the King James Bible. And so if you want to reassert something traditional, it's going to be cloaked in Christian language. That I think explains a lot of why Christian nationalism is a deep strand in American life and why it has recently come to the fore with a, a newfound kind of vengeance. Yeah. You did refer to a, a couple of events that were jarring, to say the least, uh, for me as a Christian. One was when uh, Trump cleared, uh, what's the name of the square? Um, was it Lafayette uh, yeah. Square? La Lafayette Square, that's right. Yeah, and then held the Bible in front of, um, in front of the church. Um, but also you refer to the rioters invoke Jesus's name to bless an attempted terrorist attack on the U.S. Yeah. Congress. Would you describe that as blasphemy as, um, or, or idolatry, or is that too harsh of a judgment to call those things? Ooh. So the two events here, the first one is in June of 2020. Yeah. It is days after George Floyd's murder. It's a mixed nationwide uh, riots and protests, some peaceful, some not. Um, and there was a, a demonstration, you know, just outside the White House uh, on, on the north side in Lafayette Square, and and the the National Park Police and several other police forces forcibly cleared the square. President Trump walked across the square to St. John's Church, a historic church that many presidents have been a member of, held up a Bible and walked back. And then they took a video of it and they 
put out a 30 second video and uh, and Trump said that people thought it was a beautiful image. Right? Again, lots of uncertainty, some violence, a lot of people fearful. You want an image of stability, strength, uh, an image of America being strong and free and whole. And so it's a Bible and a church, right? Those are the images that a person in authority, the president, wants to project to say, calm down, we're in charge, uh, things are fine, we're, we're reasserting what it means to be an American here. Those images of America, the presidency, authority, Trump was flanked by the Secretary of Defense, by the uh, Chief of Staff, by the Attorney General, by the, um, uh, by the military figure, uh, all projecting authority, but also projecting Christianity, right? So it's a very strong image of Christian nationalism. I'm not sure I'd go quite so far as to say in that instance that it was, uh, uh, you didn't say heresy. Blasphemous. But, but yeah, I might say that for the second event you mentioned which was the, the terrorist attack on the United States Congress in January 2021. And I, I want to be very specific that I think it was a terrorist attack. Uh, most people call it a riot or a protest or an, even an insurrection. Look, I've studied this stuff around the world. Political violence in, intended to change public policy, we call that terrorism. And when a thousand people violently broke into the Capitol, injuring and wounding 150 police officers, armed with weapons, possibly intending, it seems, to, uh, to kidnap or even assassinate members of Congress, I call that an attempted terrorist attack. I think that is an accurate way of describing it. Then they stopped and they prayed. And they prayed in Jesus' name. They were very explicit and clear about that. To invoke Jesus' name to bless a terrorist attack, yeah, I think that's blasphemy. I think it's fair to say that. When Muslims do that, we call it jihadist terrorism, and, and, and Muslims around the world stand up and say, they don't represent my faith. That's not true Islam. True Islam is peace. And we are always saying, well, you need to condemn that. Well, okay, Christians, you need to condemn political violence done in Jesus' name. You have to do that if you're going to hold Muslims up to the same standard. So I have no patience for anybody who downplays January 6th or political violence in Jesus' name. I, I really appreciate that. Um, and and it's, it's, um, it's heartening because you are also finding a language, finding a vocabulary uh, for events and reactions to events that I've had that I haven't been able to find to, to articulate quite that clearly. So I, I really appreciate that. So for us Christians, as well as for my non-Christian family members and, and neighbors, what can we do about all this? Is there, do you have any good words of wisdom, is there a healthy way forward? Um, that, that's a great question, and that's one I get so often. And it makes me think that um, I maybe could have added something to the book, some practical takeaway at the end. You know, what do we do now? What comes next? That sort of thing. And I do end the book with an exhortation to pastors, because I do think pastors have a real role to play in whatever comes next and whatever kind of solution there might be. And this is a role that I think some pastors are going to be uncomfortable with. But pastors shape the lives of their people, and they shape the way people think, not just about their spiritual lives, but also about their social, cultural, political lives, because they're not actually as separate as we think they are. And I think that pastors should feel more comfortable to teach, not about politics, not certainly not in a partisan way, but simply to teach the full implications of the gospel, because the gospel does have implications socially, politi politically, and culturally. And uh, that probably looks like sermons that don't just focus on inward salvation and family life, but also focus on how to love your neighbor, practically speaking, how to be involved in your community, how to love people politically, uh, through whatever means are available in your particular context, in your local neighborhood or your state, your county, um, or your nation. Uh, so that is one answer of what comes next is I think pastors need to embrace this role. Mm. And I, I think, you know, for the rest of us who aren't pastors, it's not, we don't just sit around, right? I want to see some organization or institution or political movement that I could point to and say, there's the thing to get involved with. I'm I'm really uncomfortable, but sad to say, uh, 
there may be institutions out there that are uh, motiv motivated well, but I feel like, I, I hate to say this, the system is kind of stacked against us. <laughs> and what I mean is kind of like the two-party system is, right? The incentive structure surrounding our politics right now does not allow for the kind of movement or institution to thrive and succeed that I would like to see thrive and succeed. And so there are institutions, they're there, they exist, uh, but I sometimes feel that we're all spinning our wheels uh, while the political system continues to be dominated by, frankly, the extremists on both sides that are you know, running things on the ground. Um, so uh, it's hard to be so pessimistic about this. You're asking me, what do we do? What, where's the <laughs> ray of hope? And I'm also looking for the ray of hope. <laughs> so if you know where the ray of hope is, let me know. Um, for now, what do we do next? We love our neighbors. We study, we prepare, we get ready. Um, and we don't contribute to the problem with hot takes or bad tweeting or uh, bad faith arguments. You know, that might be actually the best answer to your question. What do we do next? We need to practice better disagreement with our neighbors. Uh, we need to relearn the art of democratic citizenship, of being in the public square, disagreeing with people and not hating them for it and not accusing them, pointing the finger and saying you're treasonous or you're a bigot or whatever. Look, uh, as Thomas Jefferson said it best, uh, we're all, he said, we're all Federalists, we're all Republicans, we're all Democrats, we're all Republicans, we're Americans. Um, let's let's rejoice in that, be grateful for the nation we have and not tear it to pieces in you know election after election. I think you're onto something. <laughs> um, I, I will say that in, in the almost two years that we've been doing this, one of the conclusions I've arrived at so far is that I, I have no power to change the system, if you will. I, you know, I'll only get frustrated if I think about these big problems and wanting to change it 180 degrees overnight. Yeah. But what I can do is I can go out for a beer with uh, my friend who has Christian nationalist tendencies. I can, you know, go, you know, go out to lunch with uh, another friend who maybe is uh, uh, caught up in identity politics and is, has a liberal tendencies in, in that direction and just have a conversation. And in that conversation, if my expectation is to completely convince my Christian nationalist friend to uh, change his ways uh, altogether, I'll, that, I'll also be disappointed. But I think, I think we can season it with just a little bit of salt. I think that we can, we can maybe get one degree of nuance to his views or bring up a question that maybe he starts to question some of his assumptions. But here's, here's the, the key to all that is that I also have to be open to the possibility that he'll shake some of my views. And I'm okay with that because at the end of the day, yeah. I'm seeking yeah. the truth, you know? I was going to say, similarly, I think probably the way I do this most practically in my life is, is just being in the classroom with my students. Mm. Um, and, and mind you, that's not quite my point. I'm there to teach them the topic at hand on international affairs. But I think just kind of being who I am and talking to the students and being available uh, believing what I believe and and letting them know that uh, we get into lots of fun conversations. And I'd say 95% of my students disagree with me on a lot of stuff. That's okay. And just kind of uh, allowing the disagreements to happen without it breaking down into bitter recriminations is for many of them an eye opener that like, oh my gosh, you can have these conversations. You can disagree and it doesn't have to shut things down or end relationships. So if there if you have opportunities to do that in your lives, go do that because I think that alone, you know, starts to turn back the tide a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that's encouraging. So a couple more questions and one piece of business. So you're one of the few guys that have come on where I definitely have a bookcase envy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what's on your bookshelf? Tell, tell me how you uh, and how do you organize it? Is it is it uh, you know do you have a system or is it just kind of random? You get get it on the shelf. I love this question. Nobody's ever asked me this before, but I, I loved giving a tour of it. Um, so there is a bit of a system. Okay. Uh, this is religion, uh, sort of religion and theology, and those top two rows up there. And each, there's that's uh, Bible study tools, biblical theology. I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, biblical yeah, yeah. theology, uh, church history, just war, sort of devotionals. And then all of that up there is political theology, like the oh. whole thing right there, those two. Then it's literature, chronological. And then over here is, um, uh, I'm sorry, that's philosophy, and this is literature, okay. chronological, history, and then miscellaneous. And then the, the other half 
is at my office on campus, and that's all of the uh, politics, security studies, military history, uh, and all that kind of stuff I do for my my day job. So this is just the recreational stuff. <laughs> oh, that's awesome! That's awesome. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm having to rework my whole system back here because you know I'm running out of shelf, and it's so uh, that's that's pretty cool. We're into yeah. a lot of the same stuff as it turns out. So my last question before we get to the piece of business is: Do you have any questions for me? Well, tell me about your bookshelf. What, what do you or or tell me? What are your three books that have been most thought-provoking, maybe most life-changing that you've read in the last 10 years? I'm glad you said in the last 10 years. Um, I would say, I, I was hoping that you'd say in the last two or three years. So there are three that come to mind immediately. One is uh, David Brooks' book called The Second Mountain. And mm. I, I turned 51 uh, about a week ago. Um, and I think I read it about two years ago, so I, I hadn't turned 50 yet. And um, it really helped me to crystallize. Is, it, is, this, is this David Brooks or Arthur Brooks? David Brooks. Yo, so Arthur Brooks, and I have to read his book um, because he's, he's writing on something very similar, uh, Happiness in the Second Half of Life, I think. There we go. And I, I read that one, and it really, it was pretty life-changing for me too. Yeah, so that is definitely yeah. high on my, it's not even a reading list, it's a book pile, basically. Yeah, um, yeah. So it really helps me crystallize what, what is important to me. How do, you know, if I'm in the back nine of, of my life, if you will, um, how do I want to be spending that precious yeah. time? And I, it helped me come to the realization, and David Brooks might actually talk about it in the same way, but for, for me, it's I want to... I want to spend my time on endeavors that are meaningful to me, that I think are on the right track, at least, if, if we don't quite have it right, but also engaged with folks that I want to be in a meaningful relationship with. Not that we have to be in a meaningful relationship and deep friends with everybody, but the kinds of folks that from what I can see, I'd want to hang with. So those yeah. are the two conclusions I came to. Another one that was really, really, um, it changed my understanding of American history in particular, um, a wonderful woman that I've subsequently become friends with, Lisa Sharon Harper, wrote a book called Fortune, uh, uh, How Race Broke My Family and the World and How to Repair It All. Mm. And Lisa told the story of race in our country, but through the lens of history work that she did on her own for family. So Fortune is the name of, uh, I think, ninth uh, her great grandmother to the ninth uh, generation. And she placed a mulatto woman in the area of Maryland or, or Northern Virginia, where uh, a certain uh, certain laws were changed, where that person who was a property owner all of a sudden was no longer a property owner and a person of color and an indentured servant, you know, and she goes through history that way. So where I have had an aversion to, uh, a lot of discussions I've heard about reparations, when she gets to that part in the book, number yeah. one, it, it made a lot more sense to me. Uh, it wasn't as, for lack of a better word, obnoxious and hard edged. It was, oh, this makes sense. So it, it really changed my understanding of the history of race in our, in our country. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it, um, it personalized it for me. Uh, and she did real good academic work, history work and uh, research on her own family. The third and, and perhaps the most profound, and I'm hoping that it's part of a larger uh, project that many of us pursue, is Jonathan Rausch's recent, his 2021 book, The Constitution of Knowledge. Mm. And um, uh, I could probably spend a half hour just talking about that. But uh, are you familiar with that one? I've heard of it. I've not read it. Oh, gosh. So it's... um. I probably have it right here, but basically he is, he is reclaiming truth, <laughs> mm. you know, and making a case for truth and diagnosing some of the problems and giving some prescriptions. Um, uh, he, he's looking at things like how, how media is affecting how we understand the world and what's happening around us. 
uh, but it's a, it's a really a worthwhile endeavor. Jonathan was interesting because he he came on the program, but we had to do two separate interviews because the first interview he came on and had so many questions for me, and we never got to the constitution of knowledge. So it was really um, it was it was a fun uh, fun couple of conversations, and he's also become uh, we've become friendly since then. But that has um, those three books have really blown my mind. There's so many others too, though. Pete Wainer's, uh, I think his his mm-hmm. book that came out in 2021. Yeah. There are so many others, but those are the first three that come to mind. So I appreciate well, that's wonderful. Thank you for that. I, I think I'm going to put constitutional knowledge on my on my mountain, my, my list mountain. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as one I want to get through. The one I was thinking of from Arthur Brooks is called From Strength to Strength. Oh uh, right. And uh and it's very similar to what you described for David Brooks' book. And I just read it last year and it was very helpful. Again, thinking about how do I want to spend essentially the less the second half of my life. I tweet less and I and I write fewer articles and I'm more focused on the books now, I think, in part because I feel like that is perhaps where my comparative advantage lies. It's a more permanent form of contribution. And I think that that's just what I want to focus on. Maybe I'll turn back to the other stuff later. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of other stuff that came from that book. It's really, really challenging. It's good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah, the books allow us because I, I read slowly. I read a lot, but I read slowly. So I end up developing a relationship with the subject matter. Yeah. And in some instances, it opens up a door like now I have to read your other books. <laughs> you know, so uh, so I end up developing a, at least a one way relationship with the author. And sometimes I get the the privilege and the blessing of hanging out with the author themselves, the authors themselves. So it's that's really cool. Well, all my, all, my, all my other books are on international affairs and foreign policy, and they're a bit more, uh, I think they're more boring. <laughs> but but if you're interested in just war theory, that was my most recent book before the nationalism one. And I'm, um, look, I'm, I'm very proud of that book. And I think that it's, uh, you know, uh, and I haven't had a chance to talk about it to, to many audiences. So if you're interested in just war theory, give that one a, a check and uh, I'd love to talk to you about it sometime. Sure. Yeah, I have to. That was definitely the one that that I spotted that I'm hmm, I'm curious to hear a, a good case uh, made for this and to understand it better. So uh, last but not least, how can we follow you online or, or keep up with all the great work that you're doing? I'm on Twitter, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> you can find me at Paul, Paul D. Miller 2, Paul D. Miller 2 on Twitter. I do have a website, pauldavidmiller.com, uh, where you'll see an advertisement for the book and a, and a collection of some of my older articles if you're interested. Um, and uh, that's where you can find me. At Paul D. Miller 2 and pauldavidmiller.com. That's awesome. Well, I really appreciate this is a great conversation. Uh, I'm so glad I got to flesh out. And believe me, I have like, we haven't even gotten to half to my half of my questions. So I might hit you up offline at some point to uh, talk about some more of it. But um, I really do appreciate you taking the time. Hopefully I got you out of here uh, in enough time for, to get to your next thing. But um, yeah, ne- next time, uh, and you're in the DC area still, right? I am, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So next time I'm in the area, we'll, I'll have to buy a lunch or a beer or something. Uh, so I can, I can ping you with all the rest of those questions. Hey, I appreciate it, Corey. I had a lot of fun and I look forward to uh, talking again. Sounds good. And as always, if you dig what we're doing here, please hit that subscribe button, leave a review and comments wherever you get your podcasts and tell a friend about Talk Politics and Religion Not Killing Each Other. Now go talk some politics and religion with gentleness and respect and have a great week. Thank you for joining us today. If you dig what we're doing here, it is super easy to follow us. You can go to our site, politicsandreligion.us. That's with the and spelled out, A-N-D. Politicsandreligion.us. And we're on all the socials, at TP and R pod. You know, TP and R pod for talking politics and religion pod. And here's a big way you can support us, by becoming one of our patrons. You can even become a producer or executive producer of our program and have a lot more say in who we bring on, the kinds of questions we explore, or just help us keep the lights on. But mostly, we really appreciate you giving us a listen. So for the whole team here at Talking Politics and Religion Without Killing Each Other, thanks for hanging out with us. We'll be back in a few days to do our little part in Tikkun Olam.